So you finish reading and studying measure for measure, but you're desperate to know how this extraordinary play may be shown within an interpretation. Well, you're in the right place. We're going to look very closely at the 2004 Globe production, and I'm going to give you screenshots from all five acts, talk about them, analyse them, and show you how you might weave them into an outstanding A-level essay. Stay tuned, because you're watching Schofield on Shakespeare. As ever with a Globe production, there is plenty of physical horseplay. And here in Act 1, Scene 2, you can see Lucio lunging for the first gentleman's private parts, at the same time as saying the adjective painful. This causes the first gentleman to cry out in pain, gives the audience a laugh, and provides a general insight into what they are talking about, sex. The first gentleman has previously declared that Lucio is good velvet, which may refer to the luxurious flamboyant clothes he is wearing made in France, but also imply that he has had so much dirty sex that he has ended up with the STD syphilis, which was known as the French disease. The National Geographic website explains how syphilis came to be called the French disease. Essentially, it was spread by King Charles VIII of France's troops having sex. After implying that Lucio has syphilis, the first gentleman asks him whether he is speaking feelingly now, with feelingly referring not just to the pertinency of his illusion, but also his private parts. Thus, it is fitting in this production for Lucio to continue the motif by literally feeling his counterpart in Banter's private parts, giving an insight into the kind of Vienna the Duke has temporarily abandoned a place where chatter and jokes about sex is commonplace and arguably an essential part of any enjoyable, lively conversation. In Act 1, Scene 3, the Duke persuades the friar to disguise him as a priest and also shows his interest as to how Angelo will lead Vienna in his absence. In the Globe production, he is wheeled onto the stage within a laundry basket, resulting in laughs from the audience as he sheepishly and in an undignified way pops his head out and throws various garments out of his way. You can see the friar picking up one of these garments from the floor and looking indignant within this screenshot. This entrance is so light-hearted and pantomime-esque that it makes it harder to take the Duke particularly seriously. When we think of the text, Act 1, Scene 3 is set in a friar's cell with a priest. What the Duke is saying is actually very serious. He is talking about the transfer of power, the failure of his government to implement certain laws, the fact that the general population has become contemptuous in relation to law and order. However, in this production, see the Duke pop out of the basket, swaddled in various elaborate scarves and fabrics, makes him someone to be laughed at and ensures the tone remains lighthearted in spite of the superficially serious content of what he says. In terms of how we respond to the Duke in the play as a whole, seeing him resort to such undignified measures does make us more inclined to agree with Lucio's description of him in Act 4, Scene 3 as someone fantastical, fond of dark corners. Which, of course, brings us perfectly onto this exam question. To what extent do you agree with the statement that the Duke is fantastical and of dark corners? Whilst modern audiences may have misgivings about the Duke's subterfuge in the play, there is no doubt that his original decision to relinquish power is founded in logic and good sense. Angelo seems to be someone able to dispassionately and methodically dispense justice. He is someone of stricture and firm abstinence. And so the Duke's decision to temporarily pass the reins onto his deputy seems prudent rather than fantastical. In particular, the reference to Angelo being strict and able to abstain from, presumably, the sexual lusts that seem to pervade the majority of Viennese inhabitants seems particularly helpful. However, what of the Duke's behaviour whilst disguised as a friar, and indeed his decision to disguise himself in the first place? Is this fantastical or something incredible or preposterous, something more appropriate for a fantasy than befitting a leader of an ancient noble city? The fact that the Duke 
in the Globe's 2004 production of the play emerges at the beginning of Act 1, Scene 3 from a basket with a flowery scarf still hanging from his neck does seem to suggest something fantastical and rather silly about the whole enterprise. Nonetheless, it is important to recognise the regularity with which Shakespeare would employ the dramatic device of disguise within his plays. Think of Rosaline in As You Like It or Viola in Twelfth Night. This would be seen as adding comic intrigue and plenty of opportunities for amusing dramatic irony rather than being fantastical in itself. That said, a crucial difference between the two aforementioned disguised characters is that the Duke already has power as a male and a ruler. Is there something particularly sinister and unsettling about the way he manipulates characters such as Isabella and Mariana, which seems beyond the usual scope of a disguised Shakespearean character, making us inclined to agree with Lucio's striking description? I find Juliet's attitude quite interesting in this production. Stereotypically, you might expect the character playing Juliet to have, have her head lowered, speaking in a soft, repentant voice. None of that here. Within the moment on screen, in this production, Juliet interrupts the rambling friar and simply seems to be saying that she repents, as it is an evil, to shut up the witterer. Her words may indicate repentance, but her confident, strident voice backs up the idea that she is happy, she is joyful to be pregnant. This pregnancy for her is nothing to be ashamed of, but to be celebrated and declared from the rooftops, even to supposed men of God. Juliet's confident fluency contrasts with the faltering, waffly sounding delivery of the friar in this production. Dub alters Shakespeare's original so that the confident Juliet interrupts the Duke once again, making him seem all the more ineffectual, inconsequential and weak. The original version is shown on screen now, but at the glow, the lines were integrated far more closely, with Juliet unable to stop herself interjecting the very second she has heard the ludicrous statement that Claudio is going to die the next day. This is a less passive, unashamed, passionate Juliet, whilst this Duke seems shambling. Could this be part of his disguise? Possibly. But nonetheless, he cuts a rather ludicrous figure in this production and in this scene, someone clearly incapable of providing the comfort or authority that, in theory, a friar should. Meanwhile, in Act 2, Scene 4, the Angelo of this production actually fondles Isabella, as you can see from the screenshot. This ups the ante. Angelo becomes guilty not just of abuse of position blackmail, but sexual assault. Something which continues when he attempts to snog Isabella, in spite of her frantic cries of, oh no. All in all, the episode lasts around five seconds. In this production, Angelo loses control completely, albeit momentarily, genuinely gives his central race the reign. He is ravaged by his own internal sexual desires. Seemingly a novice in this area, he becomes a sexual predator and surpasses Claudio's so-called sin due to the total lack of mutuality. So, is the Duke fantastical and of dark corners? The suggestion that the Duke is fantastical would seem to indicate that he is someone who comes up with extravagantly fanciful plans and ideas. However, on many levels, this claim does not stand up to close scrutiny. Firstly, Vienna is in a mess, and who better than someone with snow broth blood and, at least in theory, firm abstinence to ensure those who commit crimes are punished? Secondly, Angelo's indecent proposal to Isabel could not have been predicted, is emphatically not of his making, and requires a degree of thought and cunning to resolve. Yes, the plan to substitute Isabella with Mariana is extravagant, but it ensures Isabella's honour remains untainted and Mariana is advantaged. Fantastical seems to suggest that the Duke is absurdly otherworldly, someone from a fantasy world. But in this plan, he devises a completely practical plan which will allow him to find out more about his deputy, something helpful in establishing future roles within Vienna's governance. That said, he can often come across as devious and indeed fantastical on stage, notably within the 2004 production at the Globe. 
as well as emerging from a laundry basket at the beginning of Act 1, Scene 3, in Act 2, Scene 3, his speech is laughably faltering and stumbling when in conversation with a surprisingly loud-voiced Juliet. Indeed, in this production, the Duke's final speech of the act is interrupted and taken over by the indignant pregnant woman cutting in to cry in disbelief, must die tomorrow. This lack of calm, decisive authority, even as a friar, makes him seem, and apologies in advance for the colloquialism, rather dodgy, someone who may well be needing to take advantage of dark corners in order to achieve his goals. I find Mark Rylance's portrayal of the Duke slightly unconvincing and, dare I say it, self-indulgent. As a friar, he comes across as a shambling, rather inconsequential figure, someone who, you may recall, was overrun by a forceful Juliet in Act 2, Scene 3. Here in Act 3, Scene 1, he delivers his opening nihilistic monologue quickly and in a rambling monotone, with no pauses for full stops or semicolons, and no points given particular emphasis. At the Globe, the audience burst spontaneously into applause, following the Duke's deliberate pause after the first half of the quasi-philosophical question about the value of life. What's yet in this? But what are they applauding at? They are applauding the actor's ability to deliver serious, depressing lines so rapidly. They are applauding his ability to bamboozle, in spite of coming across as a figure of apparently little gravitas and authority, as a friar at least. It's difficult to know what to make of this duke and what his motives are in this scene and in this production. He seems to be speaking off pat rather than with conviction, which is perhaps just as well when his lines are pointing to the fact that Claudio, a father to be, remember, has absolutely nothing to live for. In an interview for Theatre Voice back in 2004, Rylance gave an insight into his views of the Duke, or at least when he is dis disguised as a friar. And so the three friars in the plays, um, in, a, in a certain way, represent three Samaritans in Shakespeare's conception. And the whole season has something to do with the, um, something to share with the effective and ineffective ways of advising or counselling young people who have these very fateful situations. So under this interpretation, the Duke and Fry is motivated by the desire to do good, to help. It isn't just about snooping curiosity and a desire to consolidate power. So perhaps Rylance here has an overview of the Duke and Fry's motives, which is to prepare Claudio for death the first victim of a much needed crackdown on vice. His monotone delivery suggests that probably he doesn't personally hold such pessimistic Jake's-esque views of life, but they are means through which Claudio can be settled down and made at least fatalistic about his death, if not wholly enthusiastic or supportive. Certainly, Rylance's Duke is not a man who likes to be serious or leave the audience feeling too serious for too long. Here the Duke puts a speedy end to Claudio's pleading by bashing him on the head with a heavy looking book, presumably a Bible, causing laughter from the audience and the mood to be lightened. Given some of the lines that have preceded this, including Isabella's suggestion that she should do everything to ensure Claudio's death goes ahead, including refusing even to bend down, this fun, silly, laugh-inducing head bashing gives us the sense that actually on this stage and in this play, Everything is going to be fine in the end, or put otherwise, all will be well that ends well. With this shambling Duke and Friar orchestrating proceedings, this Samaritan figure, in the actor's own words, things may take time, but ultimately they will be sorted out. Another comic moment, when really there shouldn't be one, is seen in Rylance's extended pause after Mariana within the lines shown on screen. The structure of the sentence makes it clear that a past participle will follow, and the extended pause cheekily invites the audience to insert a far dirtier one than that in Shakespeare's text, something along the lines of shagged, for instance. This invitation results in a laugh, and once again the audience is left with the impression that, yes, this plan may be complicated and probably morally problematic, 
but we are watching a comedy and we should relax knowing that intricate jumbled pieces will be largely happily resolved by the end of Act 5. What isn't comic, though, is this interesting change made to one of Aeschylus's lines towards the end of Act 3, Scene 2. Rather cleverly, rather than conclude that Angelo sees himself pompously and unhelpfully as the personification of justice, which presumably excludes the possibility of compassion or humanity, Aeschylus's final words describe him as just ice. This alteration continues and extends Lucio's imagery from earlier in the scene. Whereas Lucio suggested that Angelo's urine was congealed ice, in this interpretation, the far more sober, respected Aeschylus has expanded this to encompass the entire man and character. Of course, this change results in a far more explicit criticism from Aeschylus. No longer is it just about Angelo's overly regimented attitude to implementing every single facet of law, irrespective of circumstances, but about him failing to have any natural human warmth whatsoever. Now for the exam question. Is the Duke fantastical and of dark corners? This statement, words spoken by Lucio in Act 4, Scene 3, seems to imply that the Duke likes secret carryings-ons and favours unstraightforward subterfuge, whilst the adjective dark may also point to possible malign intent. After all, if you are the leader and want only the best for your people, why the lack of candour and simplicity? This certainly seems the case in Act 3 of the play, in which the Duke, disguised as a friar, not only directs an extraordinary non-Christian nihilistic tirade at Claudio under the guise of preparing him for death, but also concocts a plan in which a woman, who has not been mentioned at all so far in the play, will take the place of Isabella within Angelo's lust-driven bed. Some might argue that, at least in relation to the latter, the Duke is simply reacting to unexpected events, which arguably demand an inventive, outside-of-the-box response. And the Duke's plan includes the added benefit of Mariana being advantaged, as well as Isabella's chastity being preserved. However, this argument ignores the fact that the Duke is the Duke, and at any point he can step in and take back control of Vienna from Angelo. The fact that he fails to do so as soon as he hears about Angelo's hypocrisy and corruption does seem to suggest that he gets a kick out of background manoeuvring and has a genuine interest in the effects of power on someone as apparently sober and steadfast as Angelo, if power changed purpose. That said, Mark Rylance, who played the Duke in the 2004 Globe production, was keen to emphasise his character's desire to help the young people who are facing these seemingly insurmountable obstacles to their life, even if on stage his disguised friar frequently seemed shambling and inconsequential, i.e. apparently not capable of helping anyone, perhaps as a ruse. With this interpretation, the statement seems unfair. Perhaps the Duke is determined to do whatever it takes in order to ensure Vienna is returned to civilised, happier, good order. An overall aim which is far from fantastical or dark. We have heard about this famous Mariana in Act 3, Scene 1, and have had to wait quite a while to clap our eyes on someone who should, in theory, intrigue an audience. She was once engaged to Angelo. Yet no one apart from the Duke knew about her, with everyone else simply keen to dismiss Angelo as a cold fish with frozen pea. What is it about her that managed to ensnare, albeit temporarily, the currently frozen one? In this production, we are treated to almost immediate signs of her continuing violent and unruly love and despair following Angelo's rejection. Before any lines are spoken or sung, we see her crying whilst rereading lines within a book, perhaps love notes, perhaps her diary from happier times. So it is abundantly clear, this is a devastated wronged woman who, God damn it, will spring at any opportunity to get back with the man who discarded her so ruthlessly. By extension, the Duke has unquestionably done the right thing by her by engineering this implausible opportunity to re-ensnare Angelo. Now, whether in this production, Mariana is composed and with it enough to be able to sing the opening song, 
which Shakespeare casts for a boy. She does it tunefully and reasonably well, and thus seems slightly less passive and helpless compared to the original text. She can gain some kind of sucker and wallowing pleasure from her own music making. That said, at the end of the song, she has to rush away after becoming emotional and only stays following the opportune arrival of the Duke. Perhaps the fact that she herself delivers a song about tragic betrayal in love in the first person has greater immediacy than listening to someone else who will be staging heartache in the first person rather than having directly experienced it. Given the intensity of the Angelo Isabella plots, comic characters such as Pompey, Lucio, and in a different way, Barnardine, are important for relieving tension and providing a broader insight into life in Vienna beyond the corridors of power. In the screenshot shown here, you can see a horse and lifting Pompey clean into the air as if to show his new number two that the provost may claim that an executioner and a board are equally ignominious professions, but he has his pride and strength and is determined to exert his dominance over his cocky new assistants. And so Abhorson and Pompey's exchange provides amusement, as does, of course, Barnardine, who is initially heard, not seen from below the stage, roaring that Pompey the rogue should go away. The reason he gives is deliciously comic. He is sleepy. The use of such a domestic everyday adjective contrasts sharply with the seriousness of a summoning for execution due to a murder charge. And so the audience cannot help but laugh. And when Barnardine does eventually pull his sleepy self up onto the stage, his appearance doesn't disappoint. He looks like a kind of crazed alcoholic hippie with his long straggly hair and silly hats. Note the sizable flask of presumably some strong spirits. Even better, his rebuttal is now aimed at the Duke, not just at Horson and Pompey, which increases the comedy. To see someone refusing the instructions of someone who has ultimate authority in Vienna, albeit currently undercover, is curiously satisfying. Particularly given the fact that the Duke is lying in a way which he wasn't when advising Claudio in Act 3, Scene 1. He is not there because of his charity, but because he needs Barnardine's head to be shaved and presented to Angelo as Claudio. And yet there is an urgency in the Duke's dealings with Barnardine, which to some extent could stem from a measure of genuine religious belief and shock at Barnardine's seeming total absence of Christian repentance or consciousness, as well as increasing panic at the probability that they would not be able to present a fake Claudio head to Angelo. Here we can see him kneeling on the floor, Bible outstretched, but Barnardine ain't having none of it. Another comic moment in this scene is the way the provost pops out Ragazine's severed head onto the stage, once again interrupting the flow of the Duke's machinations. In this production, lines 99 and 100 are cut, and there is a pause of a full 17 seconds, during which the Duke staggers back in shock, gags, and sits in a strange hanging position from which he is unable to see the severed head, before the provost in a patronising come reassuring tone reassures him that he will carry the head himself. Once again with this production, we are seeing that the Duke, in the guise as a friar, seems someone who can be talked over, someone who is apparently fragile and hapless, yet someone who is ultimately persuading everyone bar Barnardine to follow his instructions. He is also less successful with Lucio, but then he doesn't actually need him to follow his instructions. He just finds his insinuations disrespectful and bloody annoying. This production squeezes another comic moment out of the severed head, not in Shakespeare's original production. When the provost trots off towards an exit with Ragazine's severed head, with Isabella about to enter through the same door. The Duke goes berserk and frantically ushers the provost towards the other exit, whilst crying, no, 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 no causing great hilarity amongst the audience. But the timing of this strikes me as significant. Particularly keen students of the play will remember what the Duke says next. He confides in the audience that he will deliberately deceive Isabella, deliberately lie to her, 
and tell her that Claudia has died after all. Why? It is to make her heavenly comforts of despair, i.e. out of despair she will learn the comforting power of heaven. This is such a strange, unconvincing reason, which furthers the impression we have of the Duke as someone who may enjoy stringing people along, may enjoy the drama of building up to an extraordinary climax in which everything is revealed, with himself as the grand hero and saviour. However, in this production, the audience is still laughing about the grossness of a man being ushered around the stage with a severed head in a bag, rather than thinking more seriously about this question. Just what the hell is the Duke up to? And why does he keep on itching his bloody feet? Now for an exam question. Is it true that the Duke seems to make things up as he goes along and that he is never far from disaster? The idea that the Duke seems permanently teetering on the verge of catastrophe and improvises haphazardly and hopefully strikes me as unfair and inaccurate. In relation to the former, a fairly obvious point is that he can choose to remove his disguise and resume power at any point, thus, for example, preventing injustices such as the death of Claudio. The fact is that he chooses to remain disguised and lurking behind the scenes, even when disaster appears imminent. This is part of his plan to satisfy his curiosity about Angelo, expose hypocrisy and corruption in the most public, dramatic way possible and ensure that his former deputy is forced to accept the crazily loyal Mariana as his wife, poor Mariana disadvantaged. That said, there's no doubt that he needs to respond quickly to unexpected developments, including the fact that Angelo reneges on his side of the bargain by insisting on Claudio's execution, and Barnardine absolutely refuses to be put to death. However, his plan to present Barnardine's head as Claudio's is ingenious, and the logic behind the statement that death's a great disguiser is sound. No one likes to inspect a severed head too closely, something which is comically exploited in the 2004 Globe production when the Duke gags after seeing Ragazine's head plonked unceremoniously by him on stage. Yes, he benefits from the occasional timely dollop of love, luck, including the suspiciously convenient death of Ragazine. But overall, there is a sense that the Duke knows what he is doing. He has a plan, even if at times the audience feel uncomfortable with his underlying motivations, most notably his cruel decision to deceive Isabella about Claudio's death in Act 4, Scene 3. The striking feature of this production is the way the Duke, at the beginning of the act, seems to take every opportunity possible to show his support for Angelo in a physical way. We already know in the text that he voices his support for his deputy with proclamations such as we hear such goodness of your justice that our soul cannot but yield you forth to public thanks and oh but your desert speaks loud. However in this production he actually lifts up Angelo's hand triumphantly whilst Isabella is holding forth and pleading for justice on her knees. Isabella continues to plead for justice and make allegations about Angelo. And what is the Duke doing? Continuing to publicly show his support for Angelo and not even give Isabella the common courtesy of looking at her as she is talking. He also persists in remaining on the other side of the stage to her. He even shakes a member of the audience's hand in favour of giving Isabella his attention, causing amusement from the audience and diffusing some of the tension in relation to how this abused woman may be given redress. So how should we react to all of this? Should we simply relax and laugh, knowing that the Duke knows exactly what has happened and will soon enough get round to turning the tables on Angelo? Or do we wonder whether letting Isabella, the novice nun, remember, struggle on without any help or sympathetic looks at all is needlessly cruel? With such pally, male, macho, supportive body language from the Duke, no wonder this Angelo can relax and smirk, no matter what Isabella may be alleging. Verbally and physically, the Duke is making his support for his deputy incredibly and with hindsight suspiciously clear. 
I rather like the way Mariana is presented in this act in this production. The text seems to present her as some kind of infuriatingly passive saint. She has always loved Angelo, always will do, irrespective of how idiotic and horrible he has been towards her. She is poor, permanently to be pitied and cannot do anything for herself. Not quite so in this production, where she shows a human side and channels years of pent up frustration into a stinging slap. Yes, her hand used to take comfort from his hand and will, in her vision, do so again. But her hand can also show her anger for the appalling way this man has treated her. This Mariana can also use her body and self to create striking visual representations aimed at prompting redress from male figures of authority. The trouble is, of course, that the men totally ignore this striking symbol and confer between themselves at the front of the stage. Thus, Mariana's representation of a marble monument becomes a symbol of her own impotence and passivity, rather than the catalyst for either Angelo tapping into his own conscience or the Duke recognising that his game may cause unnecessary temporary pain. At times, the Duke certainly strikes me as being brutishly insensitive, both in the text and in this production. Or is he just bloody clueless? In this production, he turns towards the audience delightedly, holds his arms aloft and smiles broadly as he suggests that with Angelo dead and Mariana in possession of his estate, she will be able to buy herself a better husband. The audience laugh and Mariana becomes desperate. And yet this is the same Duke who in Act 3, Scene 1, suggested that he knew exactly how Mariana felt about Angelo telling Isabella that she had in her the continuance of her first affection and that her love, far from being quenched by his unkindness, had become more violent and unruly. So as ever, we must ask ourselves, what is this Duke up to? Is he just recognising contemporary attitudes of his time, which prioritise the crucial importance of women achieving financial security ahead of romantic love? Or is he looking to toy with Angelo, make him suffer and to hell with Mariana's feelings, with his ultimate aim making himself seem all the more the saviour when he, and only he, chooses to unravel and pardon all? As the final act reaches its conclusion, this Duke ironically seems less in control, in spite of his quick-fire pardons and judgments on all kinds of people. His voice tremors with emotion as he urges couples to be happy and love each other. He even gives Aeschylus a random hug, much to the surprise of the latter. Why is this? Well, it seems to me as though he is nervous about Isabella and whether she will be prepared to marry him. In this screenshot, the Duke has his eyes closed and his hand to his heart whilst Isabella is speaking. Is he thinking here, this is the saintly woman I love and must have? And her facial expression after the first proposal is not promising. Gaping, open-mouthed astonishment as if to say, what the hell? Have you gone mad? Thus, this Duke doesn't risk giving Isabella time to reply to his second proposal. Instead, we move on to the traditional globe end of play dance something which all cast members take part in, and Isabella cannot turn down the Duke's arm. She has agreed to dance, but it is left ambiguous about whether she has any intention of accepting him as her husband. Time for another one of my sample paragraphs, this time whether many of the play's outcomes are obviously unjust. The suggesting that many of the play's outcomes seems obviously unjust strikes me as somewhat unfair and inaccurate. Barnardine has been in prison for a whopping nine years within an appalling no man's land as he continually waits to find out whether the state will manage to persevere with his execution. Many audience members will feel that enough is enough and that this gloriously intractable individual deserves better times to come. Meanwhile, Angelo has been forced to marry Mariana, someone with whom he has consummated his relationship and someone who has loved him for years. Again, most audience members will feel that, over time, this relationship has the potential to develop 
especially given the violent and unruly nature of Mariana's feelings and passion for Angelo. Claudio's death sentence has been rescinded and he has simply been urged to restore that you wronged. Given that Juliet early confirmed that their sex sessions were mutually committed and that she loves him, there is no reason to suppose that their relationship will not flourish, especially given the narrowness of Claudio's escape. In the Globe production from 2004, Juliet enters the stage with their baby. The pair embrace and seem blissfully happy. However, the one outcome which will always provoke ferocious debate relates to Isabella and her relationship with the Duke. Does her textual silence indicate, especially for a modern audience, coercion? Certainly, his unravelling of Claudio and his first marriage proposal within a certain sentence disturbs. If he be like your brother, for his sake is he pardoned, and for your lovely sake give me your hand. It is almost as though it is tit for tat, a measure for a measure, the saving of Claudio in exchange for a life of bondage to a highly manipulative, albeit rich and wealthy man. Returning to the 2004 Glow production, Isabella certainly looks dumbstruck the first time the Duke suggests marriage. And at this point, there is no doubt that the audience will feel a burning sense of injustice if they conclude that Isabella, a trainee nun lest we forget, will have no choice but to accept this man as a husband. But this is left deliberately ambiguous. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, exploring a key interpretation of the play and giving you moments from all five acts and showing you how to weave in references within an A-star, A-level essay. Many thanks for watching.